Thank you, Calma. Jessica. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 3602 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revised business programme. And I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 3602. Formally moved. Thank you. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. I will now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 3602 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. The next item of business today is topical questions. And we start with question number one from Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to increase the eligibility age for the concessionary travel scheme. Uh, and Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, as previously mentioned uh, in this chamber, we will undertake a consultation with key stakeholders about ways to ensure the sustainability of the concessionary travel scheme uh, to ensure that it's maintained for our older and disabled people. Uh, people are, of course, living longer, staying healthy for longer, staying in work later in life. We want to ensure that our successful concessionary bus travel scheme continues to benefit those who have the greatest resilience, uh, reliance uh, I should say, on free bus travel. At the same time, we want to extend concessionary travel to young modern apprentices and later on to young recipients of job grants. Uh, therefore, we need to look at the longer term sustainability of the scheme. So we must not prejudge the outcome of the consultation. And we will, of course, listen to a range of views put forward across Scotland. But let me be unequivocally clear uh, on this matter. Anyone with a bus pass will continue to keep that bus pass uh, and will be unaffected and remain eligible to the benefits of the scheme. My grumbles. Well, the National Concessionary Travel Scheme, guided through Parliament by my colleague Tavish Scott, has been a great success. It promotes social inclusion. It helps older people lead more active lives. It encourages people to leave their cars at home, and it's good for the environment. It's a win-win situation. It gives freedom, and for some, a, lifetime, a lifeline. People will not be impressed by the government's attempts, the SNP's attempts, to sweep changes about this under the carpet until after the council elections in May, as noted in, in an article in the Sunday papers. What's preventing the Scottish Government coming clean absolutely now so that people know exactly where they stand as to the Scottish Government's view on this? Minister. Well, let me first try on a consensual note to agree with him about the benefits of the scheme. And may I remind uh, Mike Rumbles that, of course, this government has funded that scheme for almost a decade and been very proud to fund that scheme, uh, despite the various pressures uh, on, on our budget. Uh, so I would agree with him on the benefits as he, he's highlighted. Uh, what I would also say to him is that he shouldn't believe everything that he reads in every Sunday newspaper. Uh, I thought it would have been a very, it would be very illiberal and very undemocratic if we didn't go out to consultation and listen to people, take their views. So what we will do is go through this in a methodical uh, process, pre-engagement with stakeholders, important to form our views of any consultation and then let the public have their say uh, on the scheme. He would understand too that the aims that we have to extend the scheme to modern apprentices, to, to those on young people on a jobs grant, are very noble aims indeed. Uh, now we have to look at the long term sustainability but we'll do that very much bearing in mind what the public have to say and bearing in mind the benefits of the scheme that I think he articulates very well. Mike Rumbles. Yeah. Presiding officer, we know the starting point from the Scottish Government, free bus travel for everyone over 60, and we know what the Scottish Government's desired end point is, as has just been mentioned, uh, entitlement for young apprentices. The question is, are there any other options on the table other than raising the age of eligibility? Uh, is means testing on or off, or is this a universal benefit? Is, will there be a fee for the national entitlement card? It would be helpful if you could rule that out right now. Don't people deserve to know what the SNP has in store for them on this? Yes, sir. Of course people will know. Uh, when he talked about sweeping things under the carpet, uh, we talked about the a consultation and the long-term sustainability of the scheme when the First Minister made her speech in the programme for government. Uh, Derek Mackay mentioned it in his speech during the draft budget. Uh, Mike Baxter, the uh, Director of Finance at Transport Scotland, mentioned it in front of a parliamentary committee. This is not a, a surprise that somehow we've managed to spring up on the Parliament. This is something that we've discussed and mentioned. Uh, but we're going through a methodical process. And the first part of that process is to have a conversation with stakeholders, which uh, I will do and Transport Scotland will do, about exactly some of the things that he's talked about. What is it that's, what are the options? What is it we can look at? What is it that we can examine, explore? 
in terms of long-term sustainability. And then we'll put that to a wide and a very public consultation. We will hear views on that and then, of course, come to a view on that. And I'm sure Parliament will have its say and opposition members will have its say on that. So this will be a very public, a very transparent uh, process, but we must look at the sustainability uh, of it. And as I say, I think most people around the country understand that extending the scheme to modern apprentices and young people a jobs grant is a very noble thing to do indeed. Uh, but we do have to look at a long-term sustainability, and we'll do that in consultation. Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. In the draft budget, the Scottish Government says that they will uh, look to constrain payments under the concessionary travel scheme for older and disabled people. So I must ask the Transport Minister right now, does he seriously plan to reduce concessions for disabled passengers, many of whom rely uh, on buses as their only means of transport? Will he stand here and rule this out? Minister. Uh, yes, I will rule that out. Uh, let, me give some, let me give some absolute certainties. Those that have a bus pass will keep that bus pass. That's an absolute certainty and they still be eligible for the scheme. Uh, they are, those with a disability, there will be no change uh, to them, so I can absolutely give them that. And then, of course, the other uh, guarantee and the certainty is that we will uh, fulfil that manifesto commitment to extend the scheme uh, to those who uh, are modern apprentices uh, and those on a jobs grant, uh, young people on a jobs grant uh, in time uh, as well. But uh, yes, I can uh, absolutely give them uh, that uh, assurance. Uh, what I would say is the Conservatives, of course, have been pushing for us uh, for a number of years to make changes to the concessionary travel scheme. Now, we're not certainly going to make the changes that uh, they have mentioned uh, in the past, uh, but I think they also will welcome the fact that we're looking to extend the scheme and therefore consulting in a very open and transparent manner about how we increase the sustainability of that scheme. Neil Bibby. Uh, at last year's election, the SNP manifesto made no mention of cutting back the free bus pass, yet now the SNP are proposing to cut nearly £10 million from the concessionary fare budget and are going to consult on restricting eligibility. The free bus pass uh, introduced by the last Labour Lib Dem government is a lifeline to many older people and they deserve to know what changes the SNP plan before May's council elections. Can the minister confirm whether the government are in principle committed to maintaining the current eligibility criteria? In terms of the consultation, will the minister ensure that all pensioners forums and seniors groups in Scotland are fully consulted in writing about the future of the bus pass? And finally, if he's saying he doesn't have a firm view on this, and this is a genuine consultation, if a majority respond in favour of keeping the criteria the same, will he respect those views? Minister. May I thank him for uh, the question. I, mean, I would say this is a, a matter, of course, that has been discussed by a number of political parties. Uh, all they'd have to do is quote from Elaine Murray, the former transport spokesperson. She said, we will be looking at the most effective way to provide support uh, on the concessionary travel scheme, including whether to raise the age to 65. So this is something that all political parties, whether it be Labour and, uh, of course, those across the, the chamber, uh, have discussed. Uh, what, what the point I think he raises very well is about consultation. We're already in that pre-engagement phase. Uh, we're doing some of that pre-engagement consultation and discussion. When it comes to the actual consultation, he makes a good point. Uh, you know, we shouldn't just rely on the online methods. Uh, it's important that uh, perhaps uh, we look at uh, how we can engage in writing face-to-face -face with various senior groups and senior forums. So I'll take away that point and I'll reflect with my officials on how we do that. But in terms of uh, our principles uh, on this, our principles are those who have a free bus pass at the moment, have a bus pass, should keep that pass, absolutely, now will keep that pass. Uh, and the eligibility for them, uh, they will remain eligible for the scheme. Those with a disability, there will be no change uh, to them. And that we will extend that scheme to modern apprentices and indeed young people on a jobs grant. And within that, we will look at the sustainability uh, of that scheme. And when he says be open about it, yes, that is the entire point of a consultation. It will be public, it will be open, and it will be transparent. Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you. I would just like to make it clear that the Scottish Green Party do not see any need to consult on the proposal. This is a very good scheme. The government are happy to fund a massive cut to air passenger duty. Um, I'd suggest that if you do go ahead with this, you think about transferring some of this. The fact that we're looking at cuts of that scale while cutting 9.5 million of a concessionary budget scheme to people who really depend on buses tells me a lot about this government's priority. They're about investing in unsustainable, polluting transport methods and hitting those on the lowest budgets hardest. Won't you just scrap this consultation now, Minister? Minister. You know, 
I find this uh, attitude that somehow the, the cut in APD or ADT, as we're going to be calling it, is only going to be affecting uh, you know, a certain class of, of people. I think that's completely uh, unacceptable that somehow people, uh, you know, people across uh, Scotland don't go on holiday. And uh, I just find that a really crass argument uh, indeed. Uh, I thought the Green Party would have welcomed the fact that we want to extend the scheme to modern apprentices. I thought they would have welcomed the fact that we want to extend it to those on a jobs grant and young people on a jobs grant. So we will do that. That consultation will be public, it will be open, and of course I will welcome political parties and those from across the chamber uh, getting involved in that consultation. But that consultation will go ahead, uh, as we have said in the programme for government, as we have said during the draft budget uh, process. And as, as I said, we will welcome the views of those across chamber, but more perhaps importantly, from those across Scotland. Question number two, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to help victims of rape. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, this Government is determined to ensure a tough approach is taken to those who commit sexual crimes as well as helping ensure access to appropriate and sensitive help and support to victims of these crimes. In March 2015, the First Minister announced an additional £20 million of funding over three years to help tackle all forms of violence against women and girls, including putting in place better support for victims. From this budget, we awarded an additional £1.85 million to Rape Crisis Scotland to enhance existing specialist support services offered to victims of sexual offences and to establish two new services in Orkney and Shetland. Later this year, new statutory jury directions will be introduced to assist our courts in considering rape and other sexual offences cases. We have also uh, dedicated resources to NHS Scotland to auxiliary the pace of work in implementing minimum standards for forensic examination for victims of sexual crimes. We are aware of the challenges in implementing the standards uniformly across Scotland and understand the particular difficulties that rural and island locations have experienced in developing and maintaining the expertise required to deliver these services to victims. This is an area we are committed to improving. We will continue to support actions to bring the perpetrators of sexual offences to justice and to improve the support available to victims. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. While I do not doubt the commitment of the Scottish Government to support victims of rape, research from Glasgow Caledonian University last year showed us the weaknesses there are in some police responses, and a women's story from the Edinburgh Rape Crisis also showed us there is much more that needs to be done. As the Cabinet Secretary alluded to, yesterday it was reported that rape victims in Orkney and Shetland are being faced with arduous journeys to Aberdeen for a forensic amnesation, as there are no facilities on these islands. Um, last year I raised the issue of medical examinations and the First Minister responded by saying that victims should be offered an examination by someone of their choice at an appropriate location. Yesterday's report highlights this still isn't taking place. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what support the Scottish Government will provide to Shetland and Orkney to urgently address the lack of provision and also outline when we can expect rape victims across Scotland to be offered the choice of a female doctor in forensic examinations? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely not. So the member raises a number of important points in terms of how we provide appropriate and sensitive support to those victims of crimes such as rape, which is why we've taken forward a range of actions, including the right to be able to choose the gender of the person who's conducting uh, the medical examination as part of our uh, provisions within uh, the uh, victims and witnesses uh, legislation we took through this parliament. There have been challenges in implementing the minimum standards within the NHS for forensic medical examinations for uh, women who have been subject to uh, sexual uh, violence. Uh, this has been driven by a number of factors. Uh, one of the principal factors that has been a real difficulty is the number of clinicians who have the necessary training and expertise to conduct these examinations. As a member will appreciate, there's a very strict legal criteria around how these types of examinations are undertaken. Uh, and there have been challenges in being able to recruit additional clinicians to undertake the training programme which the National Education uh, Scotland within NHS provide uh, for uh, medical examiners. We are now undertaking further work uh, part of which will be taken forward by uh, NES, uh, NHS within the NHS, uh, which is part of a survey of doctors who, female doctors who may be interested in actually undertaking this form of examination work. And that work will be taken forward over the coming weeks with a view to recruiting more clinicians into conducting these types of 
uh, examinations. Uh, the other part which has been uh, challenging, particularly for our island communities and some of our rural communities, is the limited numbers of instances where sexual violence may take place. And therefore, uh, the staff who do receive training, having the required skills uh, in being able to conduct these examinations on a regular basis. And that has proven to be one of the challenges, again, in some of our rural and island communities. And in order to make sure we get a greater consistency in approach in the applying of these minimum standards, that's why I've provided additional resource to National Services Scotland, again within the NHS, with a dedicated coordinators post uh, going with this over the next two years that will be responsible for looking at the actions that all boards have taken to meet these standards, to identify where there are gaps, and to also set forward what action needs to be taken in order to address those gaps. Claire Baker. Um, I appreciate the challenges being outlined by the Cabinet Secretary, but some timescales or targets around these uh, problems would be appreciated, I think, by victims who can see these issues starting to be resolved. Um, President Officer, last week we also saw the conclusion of the civil rape case brought forward by Denise Clare. Uh, many people will ask, given the outcome and the evidence that was presented, why this case wasn't taken forward as a criminal matter. With only 12% of reported rapes and attempted rapes making it to court, victims are often left without justice. It is recognised that rape is a complex crime to prosecute, but Parliament passed the Sexual Offences Act in 2009, which explicitly states that agreement cannot be given freely if under the influence of alcohol. We have heard increasing calls for the Crown Office to revisit their original decision and for an inquiry into why this case never proceeded to trial. Will the Scottish Government support undertaking an appropriate inquiry into the Crown Office's decision not to prosecute? And will they review the application of the 2009 Act so that victims of rape can be confident they will receive the utmost care and ultimately justice from the point of reporting this heinous crime to the verdict? Minister. Uh, well, the member uh, made uh, two uh, particular uh, points. And the issue and what, uh, what is the time frame around some of the work which has been taken forward to help to support those particular health boards where they are experiencing challenges such as Shetley, uh, Shet uh, Shetland and uh, Orkney. Uh, some of that work has been taken forward at the present moment. So the coordinator is already in post uh, in working with health boards. The survey is about to uh, commence. It is going through a pilot process just now at the present time before it is sent out to uh, all health board areas and the different clinical uh, groups uh, that could uh, participate in supporting this area of work. There is also work being taken forward as part of the domestic abuse and sexual violence strategy with NHS uh, Shetland uh, and the local police uh, in partnership with the Rape Crisis Shetland to look at what measures can be taken forward at a local level uh, to provide a better uh, response to uh, women who are subject to uh, sexual uh, violence. So some of that work has been taken forward at the present moment, but I accept that the standard and level of service which has been provided at the present moment is not uniformly to the level that I expect. And I think everyone in this chamber would expect for women who have experienced such, uh, uh, such crimes and are determined to do everything we can in order to get a greater consistency right across the country, uh, notwithstanding the challenges in our rural and uh, island communities. With regards to uh, the civil case uh, that was uh, considered uh, last week, as a member will recognise uh, prosecution um, of these types of matters is uh, an issue for our independent uh, prosecution services here in Scotland and it wouldn't be appropriate uh, for ministers to engage in these issues. But the member will also recognise that the criminal proceedings uh, 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 statistics were published last week which demonstrated that there was a, an increase in the number of uh, sexual uh, offences uh, convictions which have been secured and we have had a consistent increasing in the reporting of these uh, crimes. The member will also recognise that the burden of proof uh, on a criminal matter is markedly different from that of a civil matter. Uh, and anything to do with the decision on prosecuting a case is a matter for an independent Lord Advocate and the Crown Office. Thank you. I'm conscious that uh, the Minister may like to know that there are four members who want in on supplementaries in this. There's no time today, I'm afraid. Um, there's two statements and a debate to be still to go through, and uh, there's no time in hand. Uh, members who have tried to request a supplementary may wish to press their buttons later in the week at other opportunities, and I will bear that in mind. Uh, that closes topical questions. We will now move on to a statement from Paul Wheelhouse, and I will just take a few moments to change seats.